Welcome to Episode 5 in our Accident Theory series. In our last episode, we learned about causation and how it can be proven legally through investigation of who caused an incident to occur, as well as through science which determines what non-human factors caused an incident to occur. In today's episode we are going to take a more in-depth look at the different types of causes. Specifically we are going to discuss necessary and sufficient causes. We will also begin to learn about the differences between causes and contributing factors, as well as the difference between causes and counterfactuals. We will end the episode with a look at causes versus reason. Historically, the determination of a single or root cause of an event was sufficient to close an incident investigation. Sometimes the root cause was the easiest path from cause to effect as it allowed an investigation to be closed as quickly as possible. This type of thinking has changed, as there can be several root causes which contribute to an incident taking place, and each root cause may have several contributing factors which need to be investigated. Contributing factors, also referred to as causes, are the links which exist in a sequence of events leading up to an incident taking place. A contributing factor can either be necessary for causing an incident, or sufficient for causing an incident. When it can be determined which category a cause falls into. A conclusion of whether probabilistic or deterministic causation exists. To determine what type of causation exists in the sequence of an incident, the first step is to determine whether a contributing factor was required for the incident to take place, or whether the contributing factor was severe enough to cause an incident. In many cases, a factor that is required may not be sufficient to cause an incident, and inversely, something that could be considered insufficient under normal circumstances could exist in a severe enough quantity that it could cause an incident. When investigating the causes that lead up to an event taking place, some causes are an absolute necessity, while others may combine to create enough causation for an event to occur. These causes can be separated into necessary or sufficient causes based on their relevance in creating an event. A necessary cause is when a factor is required to be present for something to occur. Although a necessary cause is required for something to take place, it is not necessarily the cause itself. A sufficient cause is one or more factors that combine and allow an incident to occur. An example of the difference between necessary and sufficient causes can be explained when discussing a city bus. Some sort of fuel, whether it be gasoline, diesel, or electricity, is necessary to propel the bus forward. However, driving into the side of a building would be a sufficient cause to make the bus stop. Simply put, fuel is required to propel the bus and a lack of fuel would stop the bus from operating. However, a large enough obstruction would be sufficient to stop the bus from moving regardless of the amount of fuel currently available. For an incident to take place, all necessary and sufficient causes must be present, or the incident cannot take place. In our example with the city bus, if the bus did not have fuel, it would have not been able to propel forward, and if the house was not present, the bus would not have collided with it, and thus came to an abrupt stop. When conducting occupational health and safety investigations, many of the factors leading to an incident are deemed as necessary, but all these factors need to combine in order to generate a scenario that is sufficient to cause the incident. When investigating an incident, if the factors that created the outcome were only the necessary factors, it is referred to as probabilistic causation. However, if the factors that created the outcome were not necessary but were sufficient, it is referred to as deterministic causation. Whether smoking is the cause of lung cancer depends on many factors, including whether cell mutation occurs, or whether the smoker dies from something else prior to developing cancer symptoms. Do you agree with this statement? Share your comments on this episode's group chat, or in the comments section if you are following on social media. One of the main points that can be concluded from the last five episodes in the Accident Theory series is that a cause is a condition that produces an effect. Unfortunately, it is not as simple as finding a cause and connecting it to an effect to determine why something has occurred. This is because sometimes what we view as a cause is actually a contributing factor. So what is a contributing factor? 
Contributing factors are conditions that influence an effect by increasing the likelihood of the effect occurring. To commence combustion, or in simple terms start a fire, three important conditions are required. A fire needs some sort of fuel, a certain amount of heat, and oxygen. Although the ratio of these three items can change, all three are required to sustain combustion. Is it safe to say that fuel, heat, and oxygen are the cause of a fire igniting? Both the short and long answer to this question is no. Let's take a look at how oxygen contributes to a fire. If we look at an ironic example of a fire extinguisher in an office somehow bursting into flames, oxygen is required for combustion to occur. However, there is oxygen found everywhere on Earth, and therefore the oxygen in the room is considered as a contributing factor to the fire extinguisher combusting not as a cause of the fire. However, if a fire occurred in a special sealed laboratory which excluded the presence of oxygen, then it would be acceptable to state that oxygen can be considered as a cause of the fire. Determining whether a factor is considered as a cause, or something that has simply contributed to a result, is influenced by the context of inquiry. Simply said, influence and perspective come from who is asking the questions, and who is supplying the answers. A peasant enduring a famine might blame the famine on drought, whereas an external observer may identify government failure to have food reserves as a cause and the drought would be viewed as a mere condition or contributing factor. This scenario sometimes unfolds in workplace environments where animosity exists between frontline employees and management. The employees blame management for maintaining an unsafe work environment, and on the inverse, Management blames the employees for completing their work tasks in an unsafe way. Investigating these types of environments requires an unbiased approach free of a predefined idea of the causes and contributing factors. Does smoking cause lung cancer? Or does being born, or simply having lungs, cause lung cancer? Common sense says these are contributing factors, but cannot be causal. Think of another time when contributing factors were not the cause of an outcome and share it in this episode's group chat or in the comments section if you are following on social media. A counterfactual can be thought of as an anti-cause because it is a belief, claim, or hypothesis that is contrary to the facts being presented. A counterfactual is something that could have occurred but did not. The importance of understanding counterfactuals is that they can help to discover whether something was the cause of something else. When investigating the cause of any type of incident, a counterfactual is used, either consciously or subconsciously, to determine whether a factor was responsible or contributed to the event. To use counterfactuals in a thought process, a reimagining of what happened during a series of events must be replaced with a more hypothetical reality which contradicts the observed facts. Counterfactuals can be viewed more as a what if thought process. A practical example of a counterfactual could occur if a person burned their mouth on a scalding hot drink they ordered at a local cafe. The temperature of the drink is a direct cause of the person being scalded. However, if the person did not attempt to consume the drink at all, the scalding would not have occurred. Although this is a logical observation after the scalding has taken place, the act of not drinking the drink at all is counterfactual because the drink should not have been scalding hot in the first place, and the intention of the person in the series of events was to consume the drink they ordered. The scientific method to determine whether an event is causal or counterfactual involves considering the outcome which we can label as O, and all the potential causes that lead to the outcome, which we can label alphabetically. If the outcome had two causes, in this case they would be labeled as A and B, and we remove one of those causes, does the outcome change? If cause A is removed and the outcome still occurs because of B, then B would be causal, and A would be counterfactual. If we remove cause A and the outcome no longer occurs, then B would be considered as a counterfactual. In a scenario where both A and B are required to achieve the outcome, then they are jointly causal. It is important when looking at the counterfactuals that exist in an incident investigation that a bias does not appear. When discovering counterfactuals, 
it is easy to become judgmental about the behavior of the person in the situation when errors were made. When investigating an incident, it is easy to judge based on the hindsight that is available now versus the information available at the time the incident occurred. In everyday life, the word, cause, and, reason, can sometimes be mistakenly interchanged by an individual trying to uncover why a sequence of events resulted in an outcome. This is because in many ways most people are only looking for a reason rather than an actual cause. The expression, we are good people with good intentions, so how could this bad thing have happened, is used to show that in the opinion of most people, bad things should not happen to good people. A common flaw in logic when investigating incidents is that when an event is deemed to be unusual, it is assumed that the incident had some sort of unusual cause. If it is assumed that an incident was an aberration, then it is easy to look for aberrant factors to explain why it occurred. An incident seldomly occurs due to an aberration, rather an incident is one of several possible outcomes, given the nature of the hazards and the controls that were present, in the processes that were taking place. It is the inherent need of an individual to find a reason for something occurring that can cause the true causes of the occurrence to be overlooked. The true reason for an outcome occurring is that the outcome was bound to happen because outcomes are sometimes improbable, but are very rarely completely impossible. Therefore, we can say that the reason the outcome took place is simply because the outcome could occur but the actual cause is a combination of hazardous factors that have been allowed to exist within the system of safeguards that have been put in place. If a worker in a factory was using a machine and the worker's hand was crushed by the machine, it is not necessarily critical to place reason on why the hand of the worker was crushed. Rather it is important to determine the cause of why the machine was able to operate while the hand of the worker was in a part of the machine where injury could occur. It is easy to use counterfactuals and hindsight to determine some sort of reason as to why an incident took place and come to a conclusion, but in-depth investigation is required to conclude the causal factors that lead to an incident taking place, and providing insight on how safeguards can be used to reduce or eliminate the incident from happening in the future. In this episode we began with an explanation of how important cause and effect are for incident investigation and that there can be more than one root cause which collectively determines what type of outcome can take place. Causes can be separated into necessary or sufficient causes based on their relevance in creating an event. A contributing factor is not necessarily a cause, rather it is a condition which increases the likelihood of a cause taking place. When investigating any type of incident, it is important to look at facts in an unbiased way and not use counterfactuals to determine causation. Here are some key points from this episode. Historically, one root cause was sufficient to close an investigation, but this way of thinking is insufficient as an outcome can have multiple causes which lead to multiple effects. A contributing factor can either be necessary for causing an incident, or sufficient for causing an incident. If a factor is necessary or sufficient determines whether probabilistic or deterministic causation exists. Contributing factors are conditions that influence an effect by increasing the likelihood of the effect occurring. Determining whether a factor is considered as a cause, or something that has contributed to it is influenced by context of inquiry. Proper investigation requires an unbiased approach free of a predefined idea of the causes and contributing factors that lead to an incident. A counterfactual is something that could have occurred but did not. In everyday life, the word cause and reason can sometimes be mistakenly interchanged by an individual trying to uncover why a sequence of events resulted in an outcome. If you are watching this episode on social media, you can scan the QR code to access a practice quiz based on the materials covered in this episode. If you are a cozy student enrolled in this course, please complete the discussion board topics found within this episode. It is also important to complete the episode quiz found under the assessment tab, before moving on to the next episode. Quizzes represent 25% of your final grade and discussion topic postings represent 15% of your final grade so it is important to complete these tasks. If you have any questions or concerns, please reach out to your course instructor.